ahead and open up to 2 Corinthians 12. I've got some more insight on a verse that's, you know, it's, it's just given me fits over the years. I've, I've, <laughs> it's amazing how, you know, it's there and you read it. You have a little light on it, but something in you, you go, man, I know there's a lot more to this, you know. And uh, I'm not saying I have it all yet on this passage, but I've got some more. I know I've got more than I had before. And uh, before we even read it, I'm, I find this tendency, not only in myself, but I think pretty much all Christians, we, we want to please the Lord. Don't we want to please the Lord? I, I want to... I just want to never sin again. I don't ever want to lose my temper. I don't ever want to complain. I don't ever want to nothing, you know. There's a lot of wannas. <laughs> but my wannabes very often are not the same as my doobies. No, my do's. <laughs> uh, not doobie brothers or anything like that. Uh, not doobies. Okay. Rewind. No, all right. We'll just leave it like it is. Got to have some fun. <laughs> You know, but I find this tendency in myself is that when you really mess up. Okay, let's go a little more. You actually cross over into sin. You know, you lost it. You did something. You And our tendency, we're so ashamed. We, our tendency is to hide like Adam did in the garden, to run uh, you know, what's, what's the, the devil is so mean. He's the one that, he, isn't he called the tempter? He's the one that tempts you to do it, whether it's sin or whether it's losing your temper or, or something. But then after you do it, he's also the accuser. <laughs> and not only is your own conscience probably smiting you, you know, uh, but that accuser, man, I mean, he's, that's it. God's done with you now. That's it. It's over for you. No revival for you. You'll be lucky if you even scratch your way into heaven, you know, by the skin of your teeth. And this week, I, even up at the conference, I kept saying, I just, this phrase kept coming through me, and I've, I've said it before. I said, when you sin, don't run from God. Run to God. And I had that much light because as a parent, you know, what do we want from our kids? Well, of course we want our kids to be perfect, <laughs> but boy, we don't throw them out with the bathwater when they mess up, do we? But what do we want? We want honesty, want them to come to us. My, my dad always told me, he says, now, boy, it's always boy, eh? boy, if you do something wrong, you're going to get a whooping. But if you lie to me about it, the whooping you get for the lying is going to be twice as bad as the whooping for whatever it was you done. In other words, he wanted, and my dad loved me. He wanted me to be honest with him and come to him and, and fess up. Can I fess up? Does that make sense? But this week, a phrase just came out of my mouth, a little different. And he actually used my daughter, Angie, who's here, so I'm going to embarrass her tonight. He actually used her to help illustrate this. Um, because, you know, her and Kevin went with me on the trip. Uh, I'll get to the Angie part in a minute. But here's the phrase that came out of my mouth. See, the devil wants you to think that your weakness repels God. And the truth is, your weakness attracts him. I said that and then prayed for the interpretation. <laughs> but he, and so he had me watch Angie. You, if you're around Angie, and it's not just her. My Sue is this way, and you're probably this way if I had the time around you. But it, in, in Angie, she just has a nature to help. I don't care what it is. Uh, if, if she saw you, if you're in a wheelchair or, or, you know, and you're trying to, you can't, you're having trouble opening a door to get out. If you will allow her, she will help you. She will add her strength to your weakness. And it, it doesn't matter what it is. If she has, if she has the ability to help her natural first instinct, Sue is that way. Uh, you're probably that way. I'm just not around you. But I was watching this, and he's going, in the, see, that weakness, if it's something that she could help with, it, she doesn't go, well, look at that stupid person. <laughs> Man, they shouldn't be so weak. They shouldn't be so, you know, frail. Not that way at all. 
if you give a, if you just give a slightest chance, there is Angie help on the way. And what you're going to find out, God's he, what he was showing me, that is grace. That is when he adds, if you'll allow him, when he sees your weakness, that's what grace is. That's what the new birth is all about. Where we could not walk holy. We could not walk righteous. We could not. Nobody could do it. He says, I have grace for that. And that grace is that nature that he puts in us. Yeah, you couldn't do it on your own. But I can add my grace. Let me say it this way. I can add my power to help you. And I'm going, this is good news. <laughs> Because I have lots of areas where I could use a little help. <laughs> I have lots of areas, see? So the verse here, now, and really this, now Paul was a little advanced. I mean, you know, he's an apostle. So he's talking from a persecution level. But really I want to start with the walking free from sin level. Because it's really the same thing. But let's go ahead and look here at 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, he's talking about the... Uh, revelations that he's had. And he says, uh, verse, uh, starting in verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now notice, the messenger of Satan, not God. This is a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And I'm just in case there's somebody who's never heard this, because I grew up in church, they told me that God gave him that thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. The exact opposite is true. God gave him those revelations to get people saved and healed just, to, just like Jesus who went about doing good, healing all that were uh, afflicted of the devil for God was with him. Well, Paul, everywhere he goes, these abundance of revelations, he's getting, he's getting churches established, he's getting people saved, he's getting them healed, getting them filled with the Holy Ghost. From the devil's point of view, Paul is the most dangerous man on planet earth. So when it says, lest I be exalted above measure, the devil's going, we've got to shut this down. If we leave this guy alone, he's going to get all of Asia saved the way he's going. So there was a specific devil, an angelos of Satan, a demon, a fallen angel. And I'm sure he had hosts under him. Their job was to stop Paul at all costs. And you can read about it in the previous chapter. Dave would say, the devil filed a chapter 11 on him. Well, you have to go back to chapter 11 to see everything that these devils did. But it was shipwrecks and, and riots and, and jealousies. And they were, he was stoned and he was beaten with, with, a, uh, uh, with a lash. And, and uh, just on and on and on. Besides the perils of robbers, perils of countrymen, you know, a day and a night in the deep. I thought, you know, a day and a night, you're hanging on probably a piece of wood from the boat, up and down the waves, you know. I, you ever think about that? A day and a night, that is a spell. I can hear the devil. I can just hear the devil's voice, day and a night. You reckon Paul was praying? I bet he was. <laughs> I can just hear the devil's voice. Where is your God now? See, that didn't move Paul, did it? So that's the scenario here. The devil is throwing everything, including the hell sink, the kitchen sink, trying to stop Paul. Now watch. And Paul didn't like it. Nobody likes it. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. And, and get this. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. I notice Paul had to hear that three times. <laughs> yeah, I hear that, but can you get this thing removed from me? <laughs> you know, I meditated on this for years, and I thought, how would God answer that prayer? There's really only two ways. Because this, this persecution is coming because of Paul's ministry. He either has to take him out of the ministry or he has to take him on to heaven. And neither of those was God's plan. God's plan was for Paul to stand strong, trust God to deliver him from every evil work, which he did, 
and finish his course with joy. And God's got that same plan for us. Now again, Paul here talking about this grace that is sufficient, he's really talking about the strength to stand up under persecution. Okay, my job is not to ignore these things when he brings them up off the shelf. If you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you want to talk about grace? <laughs> you read about these people, they burned them at the stake for the most silly, we would say the most silly things. Like if you do not agree that the wafer when they serve communion, if you do not agree that that becomes the literal skin, the literal flesh of Jesus Christ, we're going to burn you at the stake. And of course it doesn't. It's symbolic. Burn me. And this, they were burning them, killing them by the hundreds, if not thousands. And you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, he gives many, many. He has them by name, a lot of them. I mean, this is not, you know, this is real. And there's this one incident. I, I don't remember any of the names. It's been too long ago. But there were a group of them. They were all going to be burned. But one of the things they would do, they, would, they wouldn't burn them all at once. They would burn one or two and make the others watch just so the torment would be there, knowing you're next. So they knew who the first two were that was going to be burned, and they, they said, if it's tolerable, if, if you can stand it, raise your arms. In other words, if, it's, if the Lord helps you, raise your arms to let us know. So they're, they're watching. See, and what happens, there's enough grease in the human body. At a certain point, the grease catches fire. You literally become like a torch. They used to use Christians like torches around the Colosseum. I don't know if you've ever read about that. But what happened, so they, to this, I think it was just one guy, if I remember the story right, they said, if it's tolerable, because it would burn the ropes off first, you know, you're, you, you're free pretty quick. They said, if it's tolerable, raise your arms. Well, they're watching him burn. He's not raising his arms. Pretty soon he catches like a torch, just a single flame just burning, you know, like a hot candle's wick. And they're all thinking, oh, God, it's got to be terrible. And when they're looking at him flaming at the worst, when you think he couldn't possibly even still be in there, he raised his hands. <laughs> God's grace was sufficient. I'm just, boy. Now that's help at a very extreme level that I hope none of us ever even have to go through anything like that. But I, where I'm wanting to start, because if you remember this morning's message, it's time to become doers of the word. The first level of that is become a doer of the inner witness, a doer of the engraving that God has done with his word when you got born again. We're wanting to empty wheelchairs, and God's wanting us to walk holy. <laughs> well, I don't, don't want to stop my lifestyle, but I want to empty wheelchairs, and I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think our path is going to narrow even more. So without, okay, so what God was telling Paul, he's going, look, I can't, I can't, the only way I can make this stop, I either have to take you out of the ministry or you'd have to die. But listen to me, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. No matter what happens, my grace is enough. So Paul, he finally gets it. He says, most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. Now notice, for when I am weak, then am I strong. God is attracted to your weakness. He gives you his strength where you are weak. Let's get a couple of more witnesses on this. Go to James chapter 4. We were in James this morning. And the verse I'm after is verse 6. Now let's start there. But he, and it's God, he giveth 
more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now let's look at it in context, though. What is he talking about? Remember this morning we were talking about people that have one foot in the world and one foot in God, and they're, they're miserable. Most miserable people I know. Hey, when Sue, before Sue and I got born again, we were, we were happy partiers. <laughs> you know, we'd go drinking on Friday night, Saturday night, and had a good time, you know. Boy, when we got saved, we left that world. But the most miserable people are the ones that only half leave it. They can't really enjoy sin anymore. They got too much God in them. But they can't really enjoy God because every time they get around God, they feel condemned because of their walk in the world. That's exactly who this is here in James chapter 4. Back up and look. James 4, 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, whosoever therefore, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. See, you can't blend it. But they're trying to. A lot of Christians are still trying to. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, that's pretty King Jamesy, isn't it? You know what he's really saying? You know what the Holy Ghost wants? He wants the relationship with you He's jealous of that relationship you currently have with the world. He wants his relationship, his fellowship with you. He's jealous. He says, no, I want you to turn to a different lover. <laughs> Don't love the world. Love God. I want that relationship with you. Got that? So do you think the scripture saith in envy that the, the spirit that dwelleth in us, excuse me, do you think the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But notice, he giveth more grace. If you want to go into God, say, oh, I'm just weak. I, I, you know, I've I got to have a drink. I've got to have, you know, I need peace. I, whatever it is, you know. I did that with smoking forever in three days. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now notice, submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Now, in the light of this morning's message, where you receive with meekness the engrafted word, that word that God engraved in your mind and in your heart when you got born again. See, you can't, you can't walk according to that new nature and walk in the world at the same time, can you? You just can't do it. You're saying no to that. If you're really born again, you're proud. You're resisting. No. No, I'm going to go have a good time with my friends. It ties in with Alan's message, too. I love my friends. Well, you're going to have to love God more. But if you will submit yourselves, how would you submit yourself when it comes to walking free of sin? Pay attention to that voice. That new nature on the inside, when it says this is not something a child of God does, humble yourself, submit to it. By that process, you are resisting the devil, and he will flee from you. And by that process, you draw nigh to God, and he draws nigh to you. And by that process, you cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Isn't that something? God giveth grace unto the humble. You want his power, do you? Listen to the new nature. Listen to the voice of the new nature. I'm going to take another step. As Sue and I began our journey, and I don't know what your journey is with God. With us, part of the journey was to make everything that we taught available free around the world. And at the time, nobody was doing it. Not the way he told us to do it. We had no pattern to follow. We just had to do what he said. And it looked, as, it looked impossible we didn't even know where our next meal was coming from most of the time, and yet he's telling us to send these things, or you know, the, the cassette, in those days it was cassette tapes. It might cost me six bucks to make those cassettes, but it cost me $25 to send one set to the Philippines. You know? I mean, it was expensive. And here we're not knowing, you know, where the next meal is coming from a lot of time. But yet, 
if we're going to humble ourselves before him, we're going ahead anyhow. I remember the first time I ever went to buy blank cassette tapes. Hey, I thought if it's good enough for Raymond, it's good enough for me. I found out where they bought their tapes. It was at that time. It was across the street, about a block and a half down. Yeah, he knows right where it is. So I, went, I had ten dollars. Glory to God, we're starting a worldwide ministry. Ten bucks. I'm gonna go buy them right where they where Hagen's getting them. Then I go out there and I'm I'm in line behind this guy, and everything's fine until I hear his order. And he says, I'd like 2,000 C90s. I'd like 1,000 C45. That means 45 minute long, you know. I mean, this guy's ordering thousands and thousands of tapes right in front of me. I'm, I'm looking for the exit. <laughs> Finally, they take care of him, and he, you know, I, I don't remember how he paid, but anyway, he paid and he walks out. I'm next. Uh, <laughs> uh, can I help you, sir? Uh, <laughs> how many 90-minute tapes can I buy with $10? And the lady was real gracious. She just smiled, and she said, well, you can get this many right here. Now, is that including tax? <laughs> I said, 10 bucks is all I got. It's got to include the tax. <laughs> that started the ministry. See, that's, that's where it started, $10. We sent them by the thousands. One time I got a call from, uh, y'all remember Rambo? You remember he was a, his real name was something like Ramboo or something like that. And Dave called him Rambo, and he was from Bangalore. And uh, I, one day he called me. This was many years ago. He called me. He said, hey, Gary, my brother who lives here in Bangalore, he come in one day, and he, he's asking me. He says, hey, I, he says, I got some. My, his, my brother was telling me he got some tapes from a, a preacher in America. And he says, uh, he says, I don't know anything about this guy. He says, the tapes were offered free. I didn't really think they would be. But, you know, I, I asked for them. And sure enough, they came. And he walked in. He had the tapes. You know, he said, well, show them to me. He, he showed him the tapes, and it was by Gary Carpenter. And Ram, Ram, Rambo says, yeah, I know him. I've been in his church. We've had lunch together. We ate at the India Palace. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. You ought to listen to him. So Rambo, he had to call me. He says, what are the odds that my own brother would receive cassettes from you in Bangalore? I said, pretty high. <laughs> we send them by the thousands, and a lot of them go to India. You know? Isn't that something? Anyway, see, obeying God is where the adventure starts. And he adds more grace. He, he empowered us to do it. I, I mean, it's much less expensive nowadays with the Internet and having everything MP3 and people around the world mostly can watch it now. But we still send DVDs or whatever they need to have if they're in an area with no Internet. Anyway, he, the point is he adds more grace. If you'll humble yourself, and that grace in that case extended to the finances. Can you tell we didn't starve? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, go to Hebrews 4. You're, I want to keep saying this. Your weakness attracts him. Your weakness, wherever it is that the devil's been condemning you, right where you're weak, God is standing right there like Angie would be standing there. If you, were, if you needed help and Angie had, had grace for that, she'd be almost, she'd like a, she's like a tiger poised. You just give her an opening. She's going to help you. You know that's how God is? If you'll learn to turn to him in your weakness, he's going, I got grace for that. I got power for that. That's the verse we're looking at here. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly. You don't have to come slithering in on your belly. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you don't have to come slithering in. I mean, the devil's going to make you feel like a, egg, you know, like a bad person. <laughs> Got to be careful. Come boldly in there. Like, that's, that's how my daddy wanted me to come to him. Now, I, I'm, he, he expected me to feel sorry if I did bad. But still, I'm a son. I'm going to my dad. Dad, I messed up and I messed up bad. I need your help. Now, look what this says. Let us come, therefore, boldly unto the throne of grace 
And I love how this is worded. You know what you're going to find first there? Thank God the first thing you find is mercy. Oh, just a minute. i got to worship the Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. First thing you're going to find is not judgment. See, if you judge... We don't have time to teach all, but if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. Is that not great? Because you, you, what you find is mercy. You're honest about it. You're coming to him. I messed up. This is 1 John 1, 9. When we sin, we confess our sin, and he is faithful not only to forgive us. I mean, that, that's mercy. But to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's like it never happened. That's why right after you go to the blood, you can, you can say, I have never failed God. Because that blood washes you whiter than snow. He, he, he removes that sin as far, far from the east is from the west. See, you can't ever find that, can you? I'm glad he didn't say north and south. Because you can find the north pole and you can find the south pole. There is no east pole. <laughs> you never can find that east from the west. See? The devil can't ever find your sin. Once it's been washed by the blood, you have never failed God. The accuser of the brethren has no evidence that you have ever failed God. I feel like going right now to 1 John 1, 9. But, anyway. but, it's, but notice how it's worded. You not only get grace, excuse me, you not only get mercy, you find grace to help. Grace to help. And he was showing me Angie all this week. Every, no matter who it was, can you make this for me? Can you send me that? Does Gary have any notes on this? People would ask her all kinds of things, you know. And Angie, oh yeah, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. You know, just, and if they didn't know we had it, she's offering that we had it. Grace to help. And that, God's going, that's, that's what my grace is. Your weakness does not repel me. It attracts me. And I'm right there to add my, Paul said it perfectly, when I am weak, then am I strong. The power of Christ rests upon me. So well, I, can't, I can't quit this, I can't quit that. Go boldly to the throne. Humble yourself. To the humble, it says, he gives more grace. So I used to think, I used to think grace was just forgiveness, I guess, because I didn't see it in degrees, like, okay, you either had grace or you didn't have grace. You either are saved or you're not saved. But there's a ton of scriptures that don't bear that out. Let's look at another one. Go to Romans 5. <laughs> Romans 5, 17. You know, it's talking about Adam, comparing Adam with Christ. And it says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they, now notice how this is worded, they which receive, what? Abundance of grace. Now, if there's such a thing as an abundance of grace, there by definition has to be a little bit of grace. Isn't that right? There's... There's a prophecy that I didn't, I didn't know this was going to be the message in time, but there's a prophecy where God talks about, I have mountains of grace for you. Mountains of grace. Then we had a, even a more recent prophecy that says, do you honestly think you could ever use up even one of them? God has got so much more help for us. See, I, I'll, I'll use me. Uh, I'm always the bad guy, you know. Use me. Instead of you, aren't you glad about that? So I'm getting some amen. See, myself, I received, the, I received salvation grace at age 33. I mean, it was bad. I, 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 and what's really bad is I knew God as a little boy. I had gotten saved and walked with God. I, I knew his voice. I knew his touch when I was young. But boy, did I backslide. I mean, I got so far away from God from about age 16 till about age 33 I don't even, I might have been twice dead. I don't, I don't know that for sure. Only he knows that for sure. But it was bad. But I received his grace 
to get saved. I remember the exact words. I, I bowed my knee. I listened to those Michael Muccio tapes several times, make sure I understood. Right there in the living room of our house on the 4th of July, 1980, about 2 in the morning, I bowed my knee and I said, Lord, if you'll take me back. I'm so sorry. See, I'm so sorry for everything I did. I knew better. I have no excuse. But if you will take me back, you'll never have to come looking for me again. And I received his grace in the arena of salvation. Boy, did I receive it. And I've never gone back to the world. Now, I've, I've not walked perfect. I'm not asking about your stuff. But I've never had any temptation to go back to the bars, back to the world, back to that. See? But he had more grace for me. See, you can receive grace in one area, but he's got a mountain of provision grace that you don't know anything about. I didn't know anything about it. I, I thought I did. When he started, got to remember, I, that was age 33. We were 45 when we walked through the doors of this church. And then I, I started doing what Dave said after about six months. And then I prayed for two years in the trucks a lot, okay? And at the end of that two years, the way things turned out, all of a sudden now, we have no job, no ministry, no income at all. And that was many, many years before I started getting Social Security. So there was just no income at all. And God starts talking to me about sending free cassette tapes around the world. I didn't know anything about that kind of grace. I, if you'd have asked me in a court of law, if you'd have said, Gary, is God your provider before this? Is God your provider? Yes. So here we go with head knowledge compared with real. I could have quoted you scripture, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Doesn't that sound good? Mad you good little Christian, you? You little head knowledge lollipop Christian? You know? I, I've, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I could have said that. And I mean, I thought I was okay. I really thought I was walking in his grace. And the, way, the best way to describe it, he gently... Little by little, one step at a time, brought Sue and I out on this limb of a tree. He got us out here like this. And once he had us there, he cut the tree away. <laughs> and we're just, there's just nothing. There's no provision in the natural at all. And I found out I wasn't quite the lollipop Christian that I thought I was. Why? How do you know that? Because I was afraid. I was, a, can I say, a scared? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know what a scared means? I lay, lay awake at night trying to believe God, trying to trust God. But I, I had head knowledge of Scripture, but I did not know Him. I did not know how to let His grace come into our house in the arena of provision. I thought I did. I'd lay awake at night, couldn't sleep. The bills are, you know, the, we're getting behind on everything. The bills are stacking up. I'd literally have visions. I'd, I'd wake up in a, in a sweat, seeing Sue, in a, you know, wearing a gunny sack, living under a bridge somewhere. I thought, oh, my God, she married an idiot. We're, we're going to wind up sleeping under a bridge somewhere. Boy, I'll tell you what, though, I got me a wife. Because I told that to her one day. I said, man, I, I may have really, I don't understand, you know. We, you know what she told me? He said, if we wind up wearing gunny sacks and sleeping under a bridge, I still want you to obey God. Well, we didn't wind up wearing gunny sacks. Didn't wind up sleeping under a bridge. And I'll tell you right now, I think I have received a molehill of his grace when it comes to their financial arena. I think in these last days, he is going to be moving mountains of finances. If he can find stewards, he can trust. Those stewards have to be stewards that trust him and are sold out to him. Richard Edgar gave one of the exhortations at the Ohio Conference and the Lord just flat asked him, he says, now, if I did, if I did give you a million dollars, 
but I told you to give every penny of it away. How would you feel about that? I love Richard because he was honest. He said, Lord, that would be really hard. <laughs> but with your help, I could do it. Now, see, there's a person that understands grace. It would be hard for any of us. And don't you think the Lord knows that? But with his help, he says, I have grace for that. Where you're weak, that's where you're strong. I keep going back to this because I keep seeing it. I've seen Angie, and I've seen Sue. If I followed you around, I'd probably see you do it. But anyway, the way he's been using me is with Angie because been, we've been together all this last week. She is just waiting for an opportunity to help. That's who Angie is. And he's showing me, if you think that's grace... <laughs> That's the way he is. And I don't care what problem you have. He is crouched like a tiger, ready to pounce on your problem with his grace. What he's looking for. Now, what would you think about somebody? Okay, no. So Angie sees that a person in a wheelchair, and they're trying to open a door and get out, and they can't get out. So Angie, she walks over. She's going to help, right? And if they humble themselves, she'll help them. If that same, if he's got a cane or something with him and he starts whacking her on the head, <laughs> that's a proud person. Yeah. I don't want your help. I'll do it myself. Well, and there's a picture of the church. So we have bake sales. Nothing wrong with bake sales. We're going to have a garage sale, right? But nothing really wrong with that. I'm just pretty sure God's got a higher plan than that. Now, I'm not against the garage sale. Don't, don't read into this what I'm not, not saying. Your garage sale is probably not going to bring in the millions that Tim needs to send this message around the world. Isn't that true? I believe what I've, even what I've received, and we've been able to do a lot with nothing, <laughs> if you'll allow me financially, but I think the grace that we have received in that arena is like a molehill compared to the mountain of it that he's got for us. So Gary has to do what? Humble himself. My father is crouched like a tiger to add his grace in every arena where I need help. And my job is to let him. <laughs> Isn't that how you humble yourself? And you know, really, when you do that, that's how you resist the devil. See, go back to Paul. What was the purpose of the stonings and the beatings and the all of the afflictions that came on him. What was the purpose? To stop him. But Paul had to learn, if I humble myself under the hand of God, there is nothing the devil can do that will ever stop me from finishing my course and accomplishing everything he called me to do. Isn't that right? Hmm. I want that abundance of grace. I don't want a little trickle when God's got an abundance. I don't want to be like the guy in the wheelchair or whacking somebody with a cane that's trying to help open the door for me. If God's standing there with his power and his ability offering to help me, I'm humbling myself more than I ever have. But it starts with humbling yourself under that new nature. That is where it starts. That's what James was talking about. Yes, sir? Now? Okay. So we're in, are you still in James? Is that where your Bible is? Too bad. Go back to James. <laughs> Mine's still in James. Oh, anyway. <laughs> and really, this is very much connected to this morning service. So if you're listening to this and you didn't hear this morning service, I really recommend it to you. Uh, today is what? Uh, the 29th of April, 2018. So find the morning service and listen to it. And then... Because there was a key here that I, we just ran out of time. But let me show you where this starts every single time. This is a verse that we've all lifted out of context for years because we didn't know what it meant. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't say that out loud. Did I say that out loud? Uh-oh. Well, we'll leave it on there. <laughs> if you leave it in the context, it only means one thing. Now, here it is. It's verse 26. If any man among you seem... I'm sorry. 
James chapter 1. Thank you. Always do that, people. If I don't give you the whole reference, please do that. It doesn't offend me at all. I want you to find it. James 1, 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Now, in the context, this morning we were very careful to, to show that this chapter is about overcoming sin. This chapter is not really talking about persecution. This chapter is talking about you overcoming sin the same way Jesus overcame sin. And without trying to reteach this morning's message in three minutes, <laughs> how you do it is by receiving with meekness... The word that God engraved in your mind and in your heart when you got born again. He says, I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them in their heart. I may have that reverse, But anyway, he's going to write it in you. So that whenever you're about to sin, there's a nature in you that, that comes forward. He says, don't do that. If you'll be teachable and receive with meekness and obey that voice, you'll overcome sin every time. But now notice that what in the world does bridling your tongue have to do with it? The first step on that path, when there's a chronic weakness in your life that you keep falling to and keep falling to and keep falling to, the first step of humbling yourself on that path starts saying about you what God says about you. Stop saying, I can't. Stop saying, I can't help but do that. Stop saying I'm just weak. Bridle your tongue is the first step on the path of humbling yourself and becoming teachable to that new nature. There is no sin that the new nature has not already conquered if you will allow that grace to come forward in you. But if you don't bridle your tongue, how can two walk together lest they be agreed? You are over, you're literally calling God a liar and don't realize it. I mean, he's very gracious. But when you say, I, okay, let's take Gary again. I can't stop smoking. Liar. What? I've been smoking for 42 years. That's not an exaggeration. <laughs> I smoked for 42 years. I can't stop. What do you mean you can't stop? I've tried gum. I've tried patches. I've tried... Everything that kind of, Remember that time I had a patch on each arm and I was chewing nicotine gum and I pulled over for a smoke break? And I was on my way to preach. Anyway. <laughs> but from the day that he really got serious with me, the day that, that I had my last cigarette, from that day forward I had to say, I'm a non-smoker. I don't smoke anymore. I had to do it. It starts with bridling the tongue. Now, I had to add action to that. But I could not, if you want to see how defeat works, what if I don't bridle my tongue? It won't be very long. I'm right back into it like I was before. He just got through telling you when it comes to that tongue, that tongue has the power to turn your whole ship. And if you keep saying, I can't, I won't, I, I, or uh, I'm weak, I'm not strong. If you start saying it, talking like that, that's where your ship will wind up. Weak and powerless. You have to bridle that tongue and say what God says about you. And I'm going to recommend something to you. It's long. I know it's long. It's in the printed materials section of our website, GaryCarpenter.org. It is called the In Him Confessions. There's a shorter version called the Mirror Confessions that are also there. There's no paywall to get to them. You go to our website, GaryCarpenter.org. You click on media. Then you, there's a list of things. Scroll down to where you see printed materials. Click on that. Right there you'll find the In Him Confessions. How many pages was it, Angie? Angie did that the last time I mentioned. He says, are you aware that's 26 pages long? And that's double-sided. <laughs> anyway, I think it's 26 double-sided. But well, I don't mean you have to do them all every day. Conquer one page at a time. Conquer one page at a time. Put that in your mouth. Bridle your tongue. Only say what God says about you. By the time you finish that 26th page, the devil's in trouble. Your flesh is in trouble. Be walking like the child of God that you really are. Did you get anything out of that? Whoa.
I'm going to give you just a little bit more, okay? I'm not going to run over much here. I'll give you a couple more verses. See, Paul, I'm just going to read them to you. You can write them down and look at them later. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. Paul talking about himself. He says, I'm the least of the apostles that I'm not meet to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. But now notice. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Now notice how he words this. But I labored, notice I labored more abundantly than they all. But notice, yet not I but the grace of God, which was with me. He knew, I'm just a man. I couldn't have endured, I couldn't have done all that I did, except His grace empowered me to do it. By His grace, I am an apostle. All right, and one more. 1 Peter 5, 10. I remember when Dave used to teach on this all the time. He says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Now in the King James it says, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So I, <clears throat> I, went, I looked up those words in the Greek, went to somebody who's really a Greek scholar. That word, that phrase that says, after you've suffered a little while, the Greek is having suffered a little. Now, it may be, you, you, let's go back to Fox's Book of Martyrs, and they're burning you on a stake. That seems to us more than a little. <laughs> but that little can refer to intensity, and it can refer to time. Well, I, that was bad, but God's grace was with that guy. And that whole thing lasted less than an hour, probably. And what is that compared to e eternal glory? See, no matter what we're going through here, our life is but a vapor. It's but for a moment. But we're going to live with him forever. Okay. Anything we go through is short compared with eternity. Paul talks about our light affliction. Shipwrecks, stonings. <laughs> which is but for a moment. See. In other words, this life is short. Understand. You're an eternal creature. And you're going to live with him forever. When it says make you perfect... That means he's going to grow you up. That word perfect just means maturity. All right. When it says establish, the Greek word means to set fast, to fix firmly. Now get this, to render immovable. You can't be moved. No matter what Satan throws, no matter what your flesh throws, you cannot be moved. And it's his grace that empowers you. Strengthen, just, it just means strengthen, like you think. I always think of Philippians 4, 19, isn't it? No, it's before that, where it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, it's Christ. It's, it's him in us. It's that grace. That he, I'm going to say it again. He is, he is not, what a word did I use? Your weakness attracts him. Your weakness. He's looking for a chance to jump in with his strength. The last one is settle you. I love this one because we read Matthew 7 this morning about the guy that built his house on a rock. This word settle literally means to establish on a firm foundation. The illustration is of a house which is so firmly fixed on a foundation that it cannot be moved by winds waves or floods God's grace makes you like that no matter what comes you cannot be moved no matter what hell throws at you you say well I, I feel pretty weak that does not repel him that attracts him that's the time to raise your hands and worship bridle your tongue I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me say it with me father your grace is sufficient for me. Your grace has empowered me to walk above sin. Your grace has empowered me to stay firmly established 
settled on the rock of doing your word. No matter what hell throws at me, I cannot be moved because you have strengthened me. You are my rock, my strength, my high tower. And I don't run from you. I run to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, hallelujah. All right, I want to stop. You should applaud. No. I'm excited about this because now every time that a, that a situation arises and we're in the past, I'd go, uh-oh. You know, like maybe I feel weak or I've been defeated there before. Suddenly I see this image of Angie helping. <laughs> but it's not Angie helping, it's him helping. And I go, oh, okay, okay. I may have fallen that, to that in the past, but I've learned a little bit more about your grace since then. I'm going to receive more grace. I humble myself to receive more grace. And that thing is going to think it got run over by a steamroller. Amen? All right, got to quit. See. <laughs> it's helping me. I hope it helps you. Your weakness attracts him. Don't forget it. When you are weak, that's when you are strong. Because he supplies his Angie help. I mean, he supplies his grace to help you. Look at her. She's like, oh, quit it. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and start the confessions now. I'll run you over a little bit. Say, Father, I worship you. I glorify. Oh, bridle the tongue. See that? Now, right now, we're going to practice bridling the tongue when it comes to this church. The enemy is throwing all of this stuff trying to get you to start bad mouthing and talking negative and saying things that you shouldn't be said, even, even though in the natural, the world thinks that's the way you should talk. No. God calls those things which be not as though they were. He has not changed his vision for this church, and we're going to continue to declare what he has said by calling those things which be not as though they were. Amen? Amen. Father, I worship you. I glorify you. I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. <laughs> Therefore, I say, your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor, they have the gospel preached to them. A minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week. We have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other while the Father works revival in our midst. We have that kind of worship that takes us beyond the veil of the flesh in order that we may worship in spirit and in truth. We worship you, Father, out of our new nature. And we give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father, at the prayer center, those that come will see a people Transform to the nature of Christ. Father, we say, in the name of Jesus, no person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the Good Shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, Discouraged, worn out, and tired. They won't leave that way. They'll be encouraged, strong, and mature. They'll leave standing upright, their shoulders squared, their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. Father, your glory fills every service. 
Every person that comes drinks of your glory. They'll leave as earthen vessels filled with your glory, filled with your wisdom, filled with your love, filled with your grace, and anointed by your Spirit. They'll carry your presence with them. They'll carry revival around this world. Father, we declare we preach your gospel. We'll never settle for man's gospel. Only yours. It's the gospel that saves, the gospel that fills, and the gospel that heals. That's why we say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Blind, see. Lame, walk. Deaf, hear. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, that's your gospel. We'll settle for nothing less. We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say at every service, the lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The maimed are made whole. And even the dead are raised. In the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed to prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched to the four corners of the earth, intercepting and stopping every mission and every assignment of the enemy that would bring circumstances against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances by rearranging them, causing money to come, and by changing schedules. We say, every person that is to be here will be here in the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough, no assignment crafty enough, no circumstances bad enough that will keep even one from being here. Father, we declare your house full. Angels are moving back. The forces of darkness over this region. They're opening up a window. A window of light. 25 miles in every direction. Both horizontally and vertically. There is a fortress of angels surrounding us to keep back the darkness. Father, angels are dispatched now, softening the hearts where hurt, hurts have wounded, where calluses have formed, where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts and creating atmospheres where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first word spoken, from the first song sung, from the first prayer prayed, to the end of every service, the people are free to receive from your spirit. The assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center, all those assignments are dismissed in the name of Jesus. I declare those plans null and void. Devil, we're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. 
Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Not you. We're an authority here. Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. The King of Kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The king has declared, <laughs> this is the acceptable year of the Lord. The king has decreed, captives, you are free. Every person returns to his original inheritance. That is the born again trail. Father, you have restored our inheritance. And at the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it. But it's received, manifested, and seen. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. The firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth. Just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Well, there are no lost people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is healed. There are no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is delivered. And there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is prospered. And Tulsa is blessed. We declare every captive free. Every wheelchair emptied. All of them, no exceptions. Every artificial help. Wheelchairs, crutches, canes, hearing aids, glasses, stretchers, bladder bottles. They may need them when they come. They won't need them when they leave. And we'll have them here as trophies. To the glory of Jesus the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time, all of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then, you healed them all now. That's what we say and that's what we have in the name of Jesus. Father, there are impartations of your spirit. We declare these are the most powerful, the most anointed, the most life-changing, the most revival-producing services in history. Fresh anointings, fresh giftings, like never before since the book of Acts. Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. So, my own soul, I command you, believe this. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. Every backslider will come back to God. They will never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb in order that my record in heaven be perfect. Therefore, I say, because of the blood, what Jesus did for me, 
according to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense. I give no offense. And according to my record in heaven, I never have. At the prayer center, the mind of Christ is delivered to both the sheep and the shepherds. It is delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore, I say, the people at the prayer center, and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. And we declare that Pastor Dave teaches. I'm still looking forward to the day right in the middle of my message. And Pastor walks up just like he's been in the, except he's better, Dave 2.0. And he just pats me on, I know how, he just pat me on the shoulder and he say, sit down, Gary, I'll take it from here. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day. Hallelujah. Every need is met. No matter how large, no matter how small, there are no cases too hard. There are no cases too late. Whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get, they get it. All of them. All of them. First, time. First time. Every time. Every time. No, exceptions. no exceptions. I declare every captive free. Free in spirit. Free in soul. Free in, free in body. Free in body. All, are All are delivered. All are restored. Father, you are provider. Father, you are provider. <laughs> Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched to gather in all of the finances and everything that is required. Things we know about now, things we don't even know about yet because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack and I declare an abundance. Abundance. Be in the name of Jesus. Not molehills of abundance. Mountains of abundance. Therefore we say, and we always say, and we don't say anything different. We bridle our tongue. There is no lack. We operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. We have all and abound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come and many to go. We send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance. in a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full because our king has found stewards he can trust. And I'm one of them. Father, if you need anything, come to my house first. Whatever you have need of, come to my house first. All I need to know is my Lord has need of it, and it's yours. I've been bought with a price. My life is not my own. I am a first-class servant. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. The second commandment is like unto the first. 
I love my neighbor as myself. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. <laughs> See, I'm just thinking, if there's not a perfect illustration of tonight's message, so well, I can't love that person. Hmm, God says, I see that you are weak in that area. <laughs> Would you like some help? I don't know how many times I've prayed, and I, I didn't realize how scriptural it was. I'd go, Lord, you're going to have to love that person through me. <laughs> Because I don't find any love in me. But that's where it starts. Then he'll start giving you instructions. He'll have you pray for him. Pretty soon, you're going to find affection coming in your heart. His love for them will start coming in you. Anyway. But it starts off by bridling the tongue. So that's what we're doing tonight. Say it again. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. Jesus, you're my Savior. You're my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave by my own free will choice. And I serve you, Lord, by serving these people that you love so much. I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people, and I especially serve your enemies, because you're trying to save them all. You'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me, my family, and all that I have, and I am available for your use. We lift up the blood stained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus on the banner are these words <laughs> Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. <laughs> Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. And where Jesus is Lord, the Father's will is done. Father, have your way. Not just 30-fold, not just 60-fold, but 100-fold. Again, I say, Lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory forever. Your will be done in Tulsa, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We have what we say in the name of Jesus. We have what we say. Glory to God. We believe in our heart and say with our mouth. We have what we say. Now extend your faith and maybe your hand this way. You don't have to repeat after me, of course. Father, every one of these pictures is somebody we've already prayed to you about. We're not praying again tonight because our faith is you heard us the first time. Jesus said when we prayed to believe that we received when we prayed, and that's what we've done. That means without doubt we shall see the manifestation of the answer in every one of these lives. We shall see it in the land of the living because that's what Jesus said. Father, for the prayer requests inside this box, 
Father, your word tells us that if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. And our confidence is if you hear us, then we have the petition that we desire of you. So, Father, all we're doing, we're just rejoicing with all these people and thanking you for answering every prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. And, Father, if a, if a stranger sent a prayer request here, they're not yet born again, not yet in the family, not yet in the kingdom. Doesn't matter to us if they're atheist, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or anything else. Father, if they had enough faith somehow to send a prayer request here, and that request is in line with your will. Father, we pray like Solomon prayed. Answer the prayer of the stranger. Father, do it in such a unique and unusual way that they will have to know, like we already know, that you're the only true and living God. And they can hear the gospel of your son and be saved. In Jesus' name. Father, we pray for every prayer cloth that goes forward from this place. You're not changed. You're the same today that you were in the book of Acts. Father, we expect the same results as those claws that went forth from the apostle Paul. Father, when those claws are laid on the sick, they will recover. When they're laid on people that have devils, those devils will have to come out. Father, that means alcoholics will be delivered, drug addicts will be delivered, bipolar people will be set free, schizophrenia will be set free, all manner of mental disease will be healed. Father, you'll put marriages back together, bring the children home to the parents, and many other such things, because you have not changed at all. You're the same God today that you were then. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Father, it was good to see Pastor Dave in the house. He looked really good, looks like Father Abraham. I like that beard. Father, we lift up Pastor Dave, Rosalie, all of their house, all of their children, grandchildren, in-laws, and outlaws. <laughs> we lift up Tim and Leah Stemple and all of their house to you. Father, we specifically lift up Christy Taylor to you today. Lord, bless her throat. <laughs> That girl sang for over half an hour, Father. We just thank you for blessing her, and she, she won't have any repercussions from that. Hallelujah. Father, we do pray for all of the ministers, not only here and their families, not only here, but also all around the world that have joined themselves to this vision, the staff, the congregations. Father, we declare, yes, sir, we lift up Daisy to you, Lord. She's a part of the prayer center, Gina and Louisiana branch. Hallelujah. Bless Daisy, Father. Anoint her. Fellowship with her. I hear she's having a ball down there with her grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Let me see. Yes, Lord. Father, we declare no weapon formed against any of those will prosper. But everything they set their hand to do will prosper in the name of Jesus. And then, Father, last but not least. Yes, sir. Father, we know we're in a season of the narrowing of the path. Father, there's time wasters that you are lopping off because those limbs just do not produce fruit. Father, help us steward our time. Help us humble ourselves when you're trying to lop something off and not resist what you're doing. Let us humble ourselves under your hand. Because the hours that we have are the same as any president or any king anywhere. And if anything, the hours that we spend might be more important than theirs. Because they're dealing with temporary things and we're dealing with eternal things. So, Father, help us. We, we know someday we're going to stand before you and give an accounting of how we stewarded this life that you gave us. On that day, we sure want to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, we fought the good fight, we kept the faith, and we finished the race that you laid in front of us. Father, we know what that race is for us. It is revival. And Lord, you will have your revival. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody says, Amen, Amen, Amen. Well done, thou good and faithful servants. You are the diehards of the diehards.